implementation and, uh, and compliance committee. Um, let me please sir, guide you through, through the flow and uh, how to, um, the uh, different presentations and uh, members, alternate members and co-chairs uh, are going to, to, to intervene. First, uh, uh, we will have uh, a short introduction to, to the event from the director of uh, the Legal Affairs Division and a uh, principal legal advisor of UNMF Triple C, Mr. Felix Rose. And then we will invite presentations for, for the co-chairs of uh, the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. Very welcome to this, uh, to this event to provide uh, an um, overview of the role and function of the committee, his interlinkages with uh, the overall architecture of, uh, of the Paris Agreement, and the work undertaken by, by the committee so far um, during, the last, uh, during the last two years. Then we will hear from members and uh, alternate members on, on the committee, on their reflections and uh, experiences working with the committee. Very, very welcome to. And uh, we are also very pleased uh, uh, to have with us uh, an uh, external expert who will be joining us uh, online, Ms. Jimena Nieto, who is a professor of uh, international environmental law and a member of the facilitative branch uh, of the Kyoto Protocol Compliance Committee. Very welcome, Jimena. She will introduce the work of the facilitative branch of the Kyoto uh, Protocol Compliance Committee and elaborate on the interlinkages with the work of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. And uh, after this, uh, there will be an uh, opportunity for, for questions during the, the, the session on questions and answer at the end of this uh, uh, event. Please don't request the, the floor before this, uh, this opportunity. I also oh, we welcome very much also those uh, joining from, from the virtual showroom. Uh, where this event is being uh, broadcast. Uh, and um, after that, uh, I could like now to, to hand the floor to Mr. Felix uh, Rose for his welcoming remarks. Mr. Rose, many thanks for joining us. You have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, respected chairpersons, and dear colleagues, on behalf of the UNFCCC Secretariat, I extend a warm welcome to all the participants and express my sincere thanks to the co-chairs of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee for organizing this event. The Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, or PIKE as we refer to it, is meant to be a non-adversarial, facilitative, and expert-based mechanism to assist parties with meeting their commitments under the Paris Agreement in a collaborative and context-specific manner. The two years, the two last years, presented a significant challenge to this committee. And the reason for this is, of course, the pandemic. This committee is the only constituted body that has not met in person yet, that has conducted all of its work over the past two years in a virtual setting only. And this is why it is even more impressive that the committee has nevertheless been able to do a significant amount of work over the past two years. And this is, of course, thanks to the hard work, the dedication, and the commitment that the committee's members demonstrated, and in particular, its co-chairs. PIKE is meant to play a very important role in the implementation of the Paris Agreement, and the world's eyes will be upon it in the future. I'm convinced of this. The most important role of the committee is to support the parties in implementing their commitments under the Paris Agreement. This support, and I stress this support to the parties is a very, very important part 
of the framework agreed in Paris. However, the work of the committee will be quite challenging. Nobody wants to be pulled in front of a group of experts and be told that he, she is not complying with the rules. I thus personally fear that the committee will not be very popular among the parties, at least not so at the beginning. This is why it is, in my view, extremely important that the committee from the beginning on focuses on supporting and assisting parties. The support function of the committee cannot be highlighted enough. Hopefully, the parties will realize over time that they are being helped and not told off by the committee. Maybe we will even see parties who come to the committee themselves and ask for support as it is also foreseen in the Paris Agreement. With this in mind, and with this thought, I welcome you all to share your thoughts and ideas on the role of Pike in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ross, for, for sharing these uh, opening remarks and uh, your thoughts about uh, the committee and how the committee may be perceived by, by parties. And I now invite uh, the co-chairs of uh, the committee, Mr. Hasib Goart and uh, Christina Boyk, to, to present the, the remarks. Hasib, please, you have uh, the floor. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished fellow co-chair, Christina Viot, Director of Legal Affairs, UNFCCC, respectable colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first express my sincere gratitude to all the participants for joining us today on the sidelines of this historic 26th United Nations Conference on Climate Change here in Glasgow. Let me also thank Director Legal Affairs for his remarks and acknowledging the work of the committee. It is also my profound honor and privilege to share my views on the work of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, a mechanism which remains at the heart of the Paris Agreement to achieve its aims and objectives. The purpose of the Paris Agreement was to strengthen global response to the threat of climate change, including by holding the increase in the global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, while pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels, increasing the ability to adapt to to the adverse impacts of climate change and foster climate resilience in a manner that does not threat food security. Making financial flows consistent with the pathways towards greenhouse gases emissions and climate resilient development. The Paris Agreement will have to be implemented to reflect equity and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, PAIC has envisaged to facilitate implementation of and promote compliance with the provisions of the Paris Agreement in a manner which is facilitative in nature and would function in a transparent, non-adversarial, and non-punitive manner. The committee's work was also decided to remain guided by the provisions of the Paris Agreement, including Article 2, which I have just read before you. The Article 15 committee can initiate consideration of issues in cases where the party 
has not communicated or maintained nationally determined contributions under Article 4 of the Paris Agreement based on most up-to-date status of communication in the public registry. The party has not submitted a mandatory report or communication of information under Article 13, Paragraph 7 and 9, or Article 9, Paragraph 7 of the Paris Agreement. Let me give you the highlight or the brief description of these reports. The report is, the reports are a national inventory report of anthropogenic emissions by source and removals by sink of greenhouse gases emissions prepared using good practice methodologies accepted by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The information necessary to track the progress in implementing and achieving its nationally determined contributions under Article 4. The developed country parties, Shell, and other parties that provide support should provide information on financial, technolo technology transfer, and capacity building support provided to developing countries. The developed country parties shall provide transparent and consistent information on support for developing country parties provided and mobilized through public interventions biannually. Others are encouraged to do so. The developed country parties shall biennially communicate indicative, qualitative, and quantitative information related to financial resources to assist developing countries as applicable, including projected levels of public financial resources to be provided to developing country parties. Pike has the jurisdiction if the 9.5 communication is not conveyed by the developed country parties. Not participated in the facilitative multilateral consideration of progress based on information provided by the Secretariat. Ladies and gentlemen, there is also an inextricable link between the work of the committee as well as enhanced transparency framework. The committee, with the consent of the party concerned, can engage in a facilitative consideration of issues in cases of significant and persistent inconsistencies in the information submitted by a party pursuant to Article 13, Paragraph 7 and 9 of the Paris Agreement. I have just read before you. This consideration is based on the recommendations made in the final technical expert review reports prepared under Article 13, Paragraph 11 and 12 of the agreement together with the written comments made by the party during the review. In its consideration, the committee shall consider the support provided to the developing countries for the implementation of Article 13, as well as capacity building support for the F ETF. Ladies and gentlemen, the committee is also tasked to take a number of measures with a view to facilitate implementation and promote compliance with the Paris Agreement. These measures are engage in a dialogue with the party concerned with the purpose of identifying challenges, making recommendations, and sharing information, including in relation to assessing finance, technology, and capacity building support. Assist the party concerned in the engagement with appropriate finance, technology, and capacity building bodies or arrangement under or serving the Paris Agreement in order to identify possible challenges and solutions. Make recommendations to the party concerned with regard to challenges and solutions and communicate such recommendations with the consent of the party concerned to the relevant bodies or arrangements. It can also make recommendations to develop an action plan and if so requested, assist the party concerned in developing that plan. The committee can also issue findings of the fact 
in relation to matters of implementation and compliance. Ladies and gentlemen, as a representative of the government of Pakistan, my country has also submitted its most up-to-date nationally determined contributions in which Pakistan has intended to set, to set a cumulative and ambitious conditional target of 50% reduction of its projected GHG emissions by 2030. Pakistan also aims to attain 60% renewable energy generation by 2030 and shift 30% of automobiles to electric vehicles by 2030. Moreover, we have placed moratorium on a new imported coal-fired power plants. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has also launched ecosystem restoration initiative to plant 10 billion trees across the country in a bid to expand nature-based solutions to counter air pollution. We aim to remove 500 metric tons of CO2 equivalent from the environment by 2040. Ladies and gentlemen, the clock is ticking and the world is awaiting to hold Mother Earth's temperature at 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the science is clear that the Earth's temperature is increasing more faster than we are expecting. IPCC's August report has made a clarion call that the world needed tangible actions to save our planet. In conclusion, it is important to assess as to how we see the compliance regime in the coming years ahead to make the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal truly within our reach. I thank you. Thank you, Hazib, for, for sharing your um, insight about uh, the Compliance Committee. And now, uh, Christina, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luisa. Dear all here in the room and also joining us online, dear fellow committee colleagues, I see some in the room and some previous committee colleagues, also dear members of the Secretariat, uh, dear Director of the Legal Affairs Division, Felix, um, thank you all for coming here today. Thank you for following our call to attend this side event. Uh, Hasib and I, as the inaugural co-chairs of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, or PIKE, as we call it. We saw it as our role to organize this side event, um, and we thank you for your interest in coming, but also for your interest in the issue of implementation and compliance under the Paris Agreement, and also for your curiosity. And we really do hope that there is some time towards the end where you can ask questions if you have something about what the committee does, what we've done so far, and, uh, and how it functions, and what its role is, and so forth. I would also want to thank the uh, Legal Affairs Division of the Secretariat for their invaluable help, not just in organizing this uh, event, but for their help throughout these first two years of the committee. Um, as Felix mentioned already, these were not easy years because we worked entirely virtually uh, and many committee members had not met uh, each other before, which posed, of course, a bit of a uh, challenge to start with, but I think we worked it out quite well, and that was primarily uh, due to the excellent support by the Secretariat. Now, this, since this is one of, well, actually, it is the first public appearance of the committee in person. We had an online appearance during the climate dialogues, but this is the first public appearance of the committee. Uh, I would like to say some words about the committee's role and function. The committee, if I could ask for the presentation to be put up. The committee was already established in the Paris Agreement itself, I'm sure everybody knows that, in Article 15, uh, but it really only has come to life 
in 2019 at the COP in Madrid, or CMA, where the first set of committee members were and alternate members were elected, and then also with its virtual meetings that it had in 2020 and 2021. We so far had five formal meetings and four informal meetings, so we've had a lot of engagement, but most of them, uh, except for the very first informal meeting here in uh, uh, Glasgow, most of them all in a virtual setting. Now, when we negotiated the Paris Agreement, the parties considered that implementation and compliance would be absolutely central to the effective functioning of the Paris Agreement. And therefore, they constituted a standing expert body in this regard in the agreement itself. The committee, which serves under the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Mechanism, is an important building block of the architecture of the Paris Agreement, especially with regard to creating mutual trust, confidence, ultimately as well accountability, but most of all support and facilitation in implementing the uh, uh, agreement's provisions. The committee's role is to facilitate, and, uh, to facilitate implementation and promote compliance with the provisions of the Paris Agreement. I already mentioned it's guided by Article 15 of the agreement and by the modalities and procedures which were adopted in decision 20 CMA1 in Katowice in 2018 and uh, form a part of the Paris Agreement rulebook. It shall function, and uh, Felix already mentioned that very clearly, it shall function in a facilitative, transparent, non-adversarial and non-punitive manner and pay attention to the respective national capabilities and circumstances of parties. It is important, it is really important to highlight that the committee's nature is facilitative. So it doesn't become this unpopular <laughs> mechanism that you seem to suggest, Felix. It is facilitative. It's not an enforcement or dispute settlement mechanism. It's not there to impose sanctions or penalties. It is also important that it avoids duplication uh, of efforts with other mechanisms and bodies under the Paris Agreement, in particular the Enhanced Transparency Framework. So it is an enabler. It is an enabler for parties to meet their commitments and to implement the agreement with the uh, facilitation and support by the agreement by the uh, committee. Okay, I thought I'd say a couple of words of who, uh, how is the committee composed, and who is in the committee. The composition of the committee was already decided in uh, Paris in Decision 1 CP21. We have two members from each of the five regional groups, plus one member each from small island developing states and least developing countries and each member then also has an alternate member. So that's supposed to be 24 uh, members and alternate members together in the committee. And no, they're not all lawyers. I've been asked this many times. They are supposed to uh, provide a broad scope of competence in relative scientific, technical, socioeconomics, or legal fields. And they are supposed to serve for a term of three years and can be re-elected once. However, for the very first term, half of the committee members were selected for two years and are now up for election, or there's no election coming up here at this CMA. Um, this is the current composition. This is information that is uh, publicly available on the website. Um, there are uh, some seats that are still vacant. We are currently 21 uh, people in the committee, and as I said, half of them uh, uh, ended their term now, or will end their term at the CMA, and may or may not be re-elected. Let me just say a couple of words about how an issue can get to the committee. How can the committee get active? And there are basically three ways. One way, and Hasib already identified this, is that a party 
a party itself can always at any time come to the committee with any challenges it may face with regard to implementation or compliance. And I think in this context, it is so important to stress that the committee is facilitative. It can reach out to the support mechanisms under the uh, agreement, whether it's uh, technological financial capacity building support, depending on what kind of challenge a party is facing. But there's always an open door, and the, the party, a party itself can bring an issue with regard to its own implementation and compliance to the committee. But there are also certain circumstances under which the committee itself can become active. And I'll show them, and Hasid mentioned them already in the next slide. And then there's a third possibility where the committee, but only with the consent of the party, um, can become active. This is what I already mentioned. There is a possibility for self-submitting uh, an issue and any challenge that a party may face to the agreement with respect to that party's own implementation or compliance. The second list is a very important one. This is, um, this is uh, a um, copy and paste from the decision from Katowice, which lays out the situations under which the committee will initiate um, the considerations of issues. And Hasib already uh, ran through these elements, but these are the core legal obligations that parties have under the Paris Agreement and with regard to these core legal obligations, for example, maintaining and communicating an NDC, submitting the mandatory uh, information under the transparency framework, participating in the FMCP, uh, or for developed country parties submitting uh, the communication under Article 9, uh, Paragraph 5. In these situations where a party has not provided this information, it's really only a yes or no, um, the committee will consider these issues. And the final, the third element where the committee can uh, address uh, a particular issue but only with the consent of the party is in cases of significant and consistent inconsistencies that a party uh, uh, of information that a party provided under the transparency framework and where this uh, significant and inconsistent, um, uh, significant and persistent inconsistency uh, uh, was uh, highlighted in the um, technical expert review report. Now, what can the committee do? And Hasib already ran you briefly through the possibilities, that the toolbox in a way that the committee has at its disposal uh, when it uh, gets active or will become active on, on a particular issue. And here again you see the, the facilitative nature of the committee. The committee will always first engage in a dialogue with the party concerned, try to sort out with the party what are the challenges, what kind of support is needed or what kind of recommendations uh, can be done. But in addition to that, the committee can also engage with these support bodies and mechanisms uh, that are serving or are under the Paris Agreement and communicate any com uh, uh, or make recommendations that it can communicate both to the party but also to these uh, mechanisms. The recommendation of a developed of a um, development of an action plan was already mentioned in order to give any party the chance to provide itself and the committee with a plan of how to uh, get back into compliance or how to uh, achieve implementation. And finally, the, the, the may, maybe the most um, difficult measure that the committee will may or may not apply is the uh, issue of findings on fact, but this is only kind of a last resort uh, measure and that only applies if a party has not uh, complied with its core legal obligations. One function of the committee which flies a little bit under the radar but I thought it would, might make sense to mention it uh, nevertheless is that it also has a systemic function. The idea is that once the committee starts working and in the course of its, uh, of its work identifies that several parties are experiencing that 
same challenge, that may be an indication that there's something systemic behind it. It's not with regard to one particular party, but something that may be in the rules of the agreement or, or just a, a systemic uh, challenge. And the committee can bring this issue to the attention of the CMA, but it can also go the other way around, that the CMA can actually come uh, to the committee and ask it to address or provide a recommendation of how to address a systemic um, issue. Important that this is not with regard to individual parties' performance, but it at least needs to apply to a certain number of parties. Let me wrap up by just saying a few words about where we are currently. Um, we already, uh, or Hasid mentioned, that we've met several times, and I would really like to thank our colleagues in the committee for their patience and their hard work throughout those two years where we, where we met online and we had to struggle with Zoom and Teams and different time zones and technical challenges, but we made it through. Um, we did prepare uh, on the mandate that was, uh, we did deliver on the mandate that was put to us, and that was to prepare draft rules of procedure uh, for uh, adoption here at CMA3. These draft rules of procedure are annexed to the committee's report to CMA3, and we had the first contact group on these issues um, this morning, and hopefully they will be adopted by the COP, but it's, uh, by the CMA, I'm sorry, but this is still, of course, to be seen. Uh, these draft rules of procedure contain fairly technical elements. I just included the headings here so that you have an idea of what we <laughs> discussed uh, over the last uh, two, two years. I also wanted to note that this is only the first set of the draft rules of procedure. There are more to come. We did not, uh, we were not able to finalize the entire uh, scope of rules of procedure, partly due to the um, challenging situation in which we, we had to work for the two, two years, but we're very hopeful and optimistic that we will finalize uh, this work next year. I would just like to finish by expressing my hope for the committee. I hope that it will live up to become an enabler for parties, implementation, effective implementation of the provision to the, uh, of the Paris Agreement. I do hope it becomes popular. <laughs> and I do hope that parties will use it uh, and test it and try to uh, figure out what, what, what uh, use and what added value lie in this uh, committee. It hasn't been tested yet, but as I said, parties can always come to the committee. It is an important element in the Paris Agreement architecture and I also think it will be necessary to use it and to have it functioning in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and that it will live up to the spirit in which parties established it in 2019, uh, 2015, I'm sorry, when the Paris Agreement was adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, for, for guiding us through the functioning of the, of the Compliance Committee. And um, now we, we would like to, to invite uh, intervention from, uh, from members of, uh, of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee to share their, their experiences, their reflections uh, on, on the role of the, of the committee with uh, uh, a view to, to help promoting an uh, uh, implementation and compliance uh, of the Paris Agreement. You are very welcome. We will begin with Ms. Uh, Diane Tan and then Mr. Uh, Tomonobu Sato. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Diane Tan. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues here and online. It is my honor and privilege to have the opportunities to speak at this event on the work of the committee, PIKE, as we like to affectionately call ourselves. Um, I should note that when I say honor and privilege, it is because when I agreed to be an alternate member for the small island developing states, I did not think I would be unpopular. I certainly hope we will not be unpopular, and my co-chair, Christina, has already mentioned that our focus is on the facilitative nature of the committee, 
we are not an enforcement or a dispute settlement body. Having said that, unfortunately, I am one of the lawyers in the committee, so if I get a bit too engrossed in the legal technicalities, I, I do apologise in advance. There are experts in our midst, but I'm unfortunately not one of them. Um, today, I'll be reflecting on the issue at the forefront as we start our work as PIKE, which is how does a matter come before the committee? You have already heard from our co-chairs quite in detail how it comes um, before the committee, and what I'll do is just share a little bit of my thoughts as we go through the different modes. There are as Christina has explained, essentially three modes of initiation of how an issue will come before the pike. First, self-referral by a party on all provisions of the Paris Agreement. Second, automatic initiation of the committee in cases of a violation of a specific legal obligation of the Paris Agreement. And third, the discretionary initiation. And that will be, of course, with the consent of the party. In terms of my thoughts regarding the self-referral by the party, this is provided for in Decision 20 CMA 1, Paragraph 20, and as it's been alluded to quite as a continual thread of, of how things go in our PIKE work, this is of course based on the party's consent. So if a party feels that they are not compliant or needs help with any particular provision of the Paris Agreement, they will put up a written submission to the committee and then we will take it into consideration. So the most important thing at the heart of it is that the party's consent is crucial. A lot has been said about the second mode of initiation that involves the committee starting proceedings automatically if a party has not complied with a specific legal obligation. Um, this is where there is, of course, a slight difference between the first mode, which is where a party's consent is not required. Having said that, we need to be clear as to which of the specific obligations in the Paris Agreement will trigger this automatic initiation and these by and large relate to obligations of the parties to provide mandatory reports or communications under the Paris Agreement. Um, and I, I, I'm, Christina has gone through it and as a lawyer I will step back and not go through all the specific clauses of the Paris Agreement. But I would like to speak a little bit about the third mode which is the discretionary initiation with consent of party. Now, as has been alluded to, these involve cases of significant and persistent inconsistencies of information submitted in the biannual transparency reports with the modalities, procedures and guidelines for the enhanced transparency framework. Um, just before I got here, I had to look at some of the transparency texts that our colleagues are hard, hard at work trying to develop and hopefully adopt at this COP in Glasgow. But this is really quite an important part of the entire Paris Agreement because we're dealing with the bottom-up approach of having the wide variety of nationally determined contributions the enhanced transparency framework really will act as a means and ways for us to understand how one other, each other um, is performing in terms of our obligations under the Paris Agreement. So I believe that this will actually be quite a crucial uh, piece of our work as we move ahead uh, with the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, I just also would like um, to highlight something that Christina has also alluded to, which I think doesn't quite get as much attention as it should, which is the role that the committee can play in terms of systemic issues identified through the course of our work. As, as has been mentioned, systemic issues are not focused on specific parties. We're really looking at things in terms of an ecosystem of how compliance is taking place in the Paris Committee. And it's where I believe that um, the committee will be able to 
hopefully as we learn to live and adapt uh, to the Paris Agreement and to make it as effective as possible. And I think I will just borrow the words of Christina, an enabler. I think this is really an area of work where the Pike um, will hopefully be able to seize opportunities where we can to improve and to um, adapt uh, the compliance mechanism under the Paris Agreement, but in my lawyer speak, of course, without changing or reinterpreting the legal obligations of the Paris Agreement. And so those are my thoughts in terms of how uh, matters are brought before the Paris Agreement. Thank you for the time, and I'll pass the floor back to Louisa. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for this really uh, interesting uh, presentation, for sharing your, your thoughts and, uh, and, and experience. And now, please, sir, uh, the floor is on uh, Mr. Uh, Tomonobu Sato. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming, and thank you for your participation in our um, side event organized by our legal team and the Secretariat, um, sponsored and facilitated by our two co-chairs, Christina Hasib. And thank you also, uh, thanks to Diane, um, for a wonderful presentation to just warm up our sort of uh, thinking and sort of a deliberation on our discussions. My name is Tomonobu, my Tomonobu Sato, just call me Tomo. I am from Japan. I'm working for the government office of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, selected from the group of Asia Pacific region to the Pike. Be working uh, this job for two years uh, since the inception of the committee established uh, in nine, uh, 2018 in Katowice, and this is my great privilege to speak to you, to the wider audience, uh, in person or virtually, and just to give us some thought and some idea, some sort of a, uh, impression on our work from our side. My presentation is supposed to be part of the whole uh, sort of organization uh, framework of PIKE. Um, uh, actually, the rubric of uh, Paris Agreement on this compliance committee uh, have two, uh, have four parts. One is purposes and scope, the overall principles. The second is institutional arrangements, organizational matters, how many people are coming or how we organize meeting. The third, as Diane expressed, explained, initiation of the consideration, so policy matters. The last part, which I deal with, is the output and measures, the outcome, a document, sort of the things we actually put in the public. So my scope is very limited, but actually by giving you some presentation, I would like just to draw your attention for the, f for the further discussion afterwards. So the title is Possible Measures and Outputs. This is how it's, what is written in our rule book, uh, adopted two years ago, and I'll, I'll go in, in further details. So it's a part of the four sections of Paris rubric. Sorry. Okay. 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 Sorry. I'm not really an IT person. Uh, so my structure of my presentation is a guiding principles of our work. Uh, the overview followed by more detailed, little technical discussion. Bear with it. Bear, bear with me. Uh, just a little complicated. And further, sort of uh, questions, uh, discussions, and some s just brief conclusion. So the guiding principles overview. Uh, we have Paris Agreement, Article 15.2. And the provision says we have to operate in a manner that is transparent, non-adversarial, and non-punitive. 
So it's very facilitative. And we have to, uh, there's a clear sort of the provision uh, to pay particular attention to the respective national capabilities and circumstances of parties, a familiar word in a price agreement. So this is the guiding principles. Further, we have Paris rubrics. Technically speaking, it's called implementation guideline. A lot of negotiators have worked for years, years, and they adopted in Katowice in COP24. And uh, effectively, it, it says decision 20, CMA1, annex, and I'm dealing with section four, and consisting of four paragraphs from 28, 29, 30, and 31. So let me start by from the paragraph 28. It says in identifying appropriate measures and finding and recommendations, uh, the committee shall be informed by the legal nature of price agreement provisions, shall pay particular attention to national capabilities and circumstances again, and we should recognize SID, small island developing states, and LDC, least developing countries, special circumstances. The special circumstances appear a lot, quite often in Paris Agreement. And paragraph 29, the party concerned, I mean, the party we're dealing with, uh, with the sort of a, uh, possibility of some non-compliance and compliance, the party concerned in response may provide information on capacity constraints, needs, or challenges, and that includes the support they have received already. Uh, for us to consider measures, findings, and recommendations. So this is like a dialogue. We do this and you do that. And guiding principle three, paragraph 30, we have a list of toolbox. We call it, it doesn't say toolbox, but actually in the article I read, it said toolbox, nice word, so it's toolbox. So we have dialogue with the engagement with parties. And B, assistance. It's not really a direct assistance to the parties, but actually assistance in parties' engagement with relevant bodies under or serving Paris Agreement. The third recommendation, we give a recommendation to party, and that will be communicated to relevant bodies, similar bodies. So it's not really recommending to relevant bodies, but actually to parties. Our client is parties. The, uh, the, the fourth, we, have, we recommend the development of action plan. So you have the problem, we need to consider, please develop action plan for the improvement. And we actually can provide assistance in the development of action plans. The last one is very critical, fact finding. I will talk to you later. Uh, the guiding principle, the last part is, uh, in response to our work of a committee, the party concerned is encouraged to provide information on the progress made in the implementing the action plan. So we, we recommend action plan and the party work on the action plan and we track, track progress. So the last part of my presentation is discussions. We can have further discussion afterwards, but actually I pro I'm providing four points. One is the toolbox. We have toolbox. Uh, as, as you see the modality and procedure, you have a toolbox. Is the whole list exhaustive? or just a part of it? There's a question. So um, according to the modality and procedure rubric, uh, the committee shall take appropriate measures, but that kind of a, a appropriate measures, list of measures may include, so it's, it says may. So there is a possibility of more, so the wider list of actions we can take. And if you look back, if you, if you are familiar with negotiation history, which I was not personally was not involved, there is a question of early warnings or non-compliance, that kind of big word appeared. So that the question is, we have, the idea needs to be based on agreeability. So we have, we, uh, the list of measures we are seeing in the rule book is the sort of something what, what the parties at that time agreed. So it's just the minimum sort of the list uh, written. So there's a question of what sort of appropriate measures taken by the committee and this must be non-adversarial, non-punitive. This is the question, this is the principle. So we, need, we are supposed to take, uh, give cautious consideration of measures based upon these things. So we, we have a committee, 
we are working as a consistent group members. Are we given discretion? We can do what we can do is actually allowed. So uh, my question, my answer is yes, but with a lot of conditions. While doing so, uh, the committee shall be guided by the provisions of the Paris Agreement and informed of its legal nature, and take into account comments from the party concerned. So the dialogue, and we have to pay again particular attention to the capabilities and circumstances. And lastly, there is a special circumstances uh, to be considered for LDC and SIT, and we need to recognize. So um, there is a question of assistance. The third question is, uh, there is a provision of assistance in, in the rubric. Is a direct involvement or more, more like partial or indirect in, in, uh, involvement by the, part, by, by the committee? Uh, it says in paragraph 30b and c. So we have to be bearing, uh, take into consideration, we have to bear in mind that we should not have interference or duplication with other part of the Paris framework. That is, for example, transparency framework or other relevant bodies. So we, are, we have a specific mandate and there are um, question theoretical question that it's a safe referral system, so the party could actually say we are non-compliant and then we'd like to get assistance. There is a very funny way of putting it, but actually there's a question, a theoretical question of doing that, uh, of that scenario. So uh, in, in the end, our, our role is facilitative and between parties and the relevant bodies through dialogue, engagement with parties and recommendations to parties. So the last part is finding a fact. It, it says, the rule book says fact finding. It doesn't say non-compliance or non-consistency kind of things. It's, there is no big word. However, the name of a pike is compliance and facil facilitation. So there, there is a sort of a, is, is a gap between our formal name and the modality and procedure and the rule book. So again, uh, our, our job, uh, Fact-finding has to be non-adversarial, non-punitive, but facilitative. And then um, there's a question we are addressing who? Uh, there is no specific provision in it, uh, in, in, in the rule book. So we are addressing party, we are public, or actually more indirectly through public uh, through annual report to be submitted to CMA at the end of the, in the end of the year. So there's a sort of, sort of the need of clarity on that. So actually we're working on rules and procedures and we have completed some part of our work and still ongoing, I hope, the next year. So this will be clarified. So some conclusion, I, I put a conclusionary remarks. This is my personal remarks. So it is not a conclusion by the committee. So we have provision and rule book and giving a set of tools. So we have tools. Uh, we need to facilitate implementation and promote compliance. And we, we, sh we should not uh, have duplication with other bodies. Uh, the last of tools in the modality and procedure are still limited, but we, have to, we can develop through uh, further practice ahead uh, in mid and long terms and the ongoing work of rule procedures, draft, drafting process. So uh, lastly, the, I can conclude that Pike is still continuing to develop more clarity on the measures and outputs. So the last part is coffee. So I am actually off, charge, uh, discharged, and then please, uh, I'm giving the opportunity to enjoy coffee. So um, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for listening, uh, sincerely. But we can come back to any topics and questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your, your views. And uh, now I would like to, to invite Ms. Jimena Nieto, Professor of International Environmental Law, to... Uh, to share uh, briefly um, her views sir, 
on, on, on the Compliance Committee, please be aware that uh, it's, uh, we head in uh, the, the end of this, uh, of this side event. Um, thank you, Jimena. here, although virtually I would have loved to be with you um, now. Uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm also a member of uh, the uh, Compliance Committee of the Basel Convention, the Compliance Committee of the Cartagena Protocol, and I am an alternate member of the Compliance Committee of the Kyoto Protocol. So after having listened to you all, um, I would like um, I, I, I felt like I, what I was going to say uh, wasn't um, it was it was already been said by uh, the co-chairs and, and the members that preceded me. So I, I would like to focus uh, on on what um, on how this will work in in practice. What I, what I can bring from the experience of other compliance committees into this uh, into the exercise that you are undertaking. And and having said that, of course I am fully aware of the time, so I will my, I I will. Uh, take even less time that I was allocated to, but I just wanted to emphasize that, um, that what you have achieved so far uh, on the rules of procedure is, is, is great because uh, under the circumstances of the non uh, present, non um, I mean, virtual meetings, doing that exercise must have been really difficult. But as Christina said, it, it is an ongoing process because, and Tomo also mentioned that those rules of procedure will maybe grow with you and, and grow with the work of the committee as we have um, as we have uh, done in the Kyoto Protocol, for example, where until uh, I think five years ago, we, we were still adding things to the Kyoto Protocol. So please uh, look at those other experiences or the, under other committees to, to develop the rules because that means that uh, you can have, you can maybe take some things from the experiences that were that happened on those on those committees. I've heard a lot of emphasis from all of the members on the facilitative aspect of the, of the committee. And, and I think that it's important to, of course, reiterate once and again. But I would also like to mention what um, Christina put as the to live up to the spirit of the parties uh, uh, that the parties intended in 2015, because uh, and, and as like um, uh, Tomo was mentioning, it, it is true that the name of the committee is implementation and uh, facilitating implementation and promoting compliance. And what was behind that was what you all already explained is that the committee, of course, has a facilitative aspect of his function. What is that? Is um, uh, what already Christina mentioned, looking at this, um, uh, at, at how you can help parties to be uh, more close to their uh, obligations under the Paris Agreement. How uh, can we can the can the, can the committee be of useful for the parties uh, in the in their efforts to to comply and and, and that's a very important function. But um, and there's also the function that uh, that was mentioned here, systemic uh, issues. And there you will find that in this in this um, uh, like early years of the committee, the systemic function will be important because you might not be looking at specific cases for some time. So those systemic issues will also allow you to uh, become uh, more acquainted with all, with how the committee will work uh, with the other elements of the Paris Agreement, and, and in that regard, um, that that is something that needs to be uh, that that will require a very heavy exercise to to see what are what will be exactly the links in practice between the committee and the other. Uh, and the other bodies of the Paris Agreement, and, and, and that function called the systemic issues will be very important in that regard. But of course, there is that third option that we shouldn't shy away from, and, and it's the promoting compliance part that ends up, as Christina and Tomo and others mentioned, with the finding, uh, with the fact-finding um, option. But 
as, as you all said, we, we, we shouldn't be afraid of, I mean, the committee shouldn't be um, afraid of that because there are all the, all the safeguards are in place with, you have been reiterating the facility, non-punitive, um, non-confrontational, et cetera, um, irrespective of the cap capabilities that all was uh, construed in, in order to make parties uh, very confident uh, that they can come themselves to the committee or the committee can start their procedures in th those other ways that Diane mentioned without being uh, what, uh, what everyone was afraid, as Mr. Ross pointed out, like um, being called for, et cetera. So I think um, that, that you will find in practice that what the work will consist on will be to look at what is happening and, and maybe in some cases to determine that some work need to be done, for example, under the systemic issues or maybe uh, under a specific submission later on. Um, and, and in that regard, I, I would like to, as I said, mention some of the experiences in other committees where, for example, in one case, we had a, a, a party coming to the committee and saying, okay, I, I need to, to uh, your help because I haven't been able to report on this and this, this was under, another, under the Basel Convention. And at the end of the process, the, the party felt that the help of the committee had been very valuable because it raised awareness at home of the need of being in, in compliance with that, um, with that uh, uh, obligation of the reporting. And they, they got help in, in, in understanding better the reporting requirements and even with the software, et cetera. So that's one case I would like to highlight because, so you can see how it, this will work in practice. In, 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 in some other cases, for example, and this is to illustrate the systemic uh, part of the work, you can as well, um, as, as Christina pointed out, identify that one that one thing in one report is not working well because any party has been a, has been able to to uh, provide an answer to for that, and this is one of the value added of the committee uh, that nobody else is doing this work in the in the whole uh, Paris uh, agreement so that mosaic uh, will be completed with the work of, of the bike, as, 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 as you said. And um, uh, uh, finally, as, as uh, you know also, the committee could eventually uh, make a, a, a recommendation of a fact-finding situation, but it was reiterated many times here that it would be on, only after having engaged with the party, a concept that everyone um, has mentioned, all the members have mentioned, and that, that will take many, many years uh, that you can exchange with the parties if, uh, uh, on, on that issue, how we can help, how we can develop a plan of implementation, and that process in itself has a value, has a value for the party. You have to say, you have to see that in some cases, the party, and I'm sorry, I, I'm taking too long, so I'm going to end here, but I just wanted to emphasize that the parties will start understanding the, the work of, of the committee and will find it appealing. Um, finally, uh, I will like to, to get a little emotional I, I, and with this I will finish because I was part of the negotiations under the Article 15 when the committee was established and I see that with all these presentations the, the spirit has is there and the work has been done in a very, very efficient manner. So uh, thank you for that because in a way I sense that this uh, child is growing and it's going to be uh, very successful. It's going to turn into a very successful man. So thank you very much for all for that. Thank you. Thank you to you, Jimena, for these uh, comprehensive remarks. And uh, thank you to, to all the speakers here for, for sharing their, their views, ideas, reflections that uh, I'm very sure will be extremely important for, for the work of, uh, of the committee going forward. And uh, now in the nine minutes that we have for ahead before this uh, event uh, closes, we would like to, to invite any questions, observations, remarks from, from participants here. Please request uh, uh, for the floor by, by raising your hand and um, we will provide you with, uh, with a mic. Uh, micro and uh, when given the floor, please uh, introduce uh, yourself. And for our online participants, we invite you please to raise your questions using the, the, the chat uh, function. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, is this available? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for that explanation. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I was a diplomat. But in, in listening to all this, um, and I see that it's written right through the agreement, the importance of having a facilitative approach, I can imagine many situations where there would be countries that are having difficulty submitting NDCs or maintaining a certain level of technical ability that would benefit from the approach you've described. But I must say, as a citizen, I walk away thinking that you're going to be completely toothless vis-a-vis -vis any party that seriously is not interested in meeting consistently the obligations of the Paris Agreement. The World Resources Institute, for instance, recently published a survey of the G20 countries, cited two of them as having submitted NDCs that were in fact weaker than the ones they submitted in 2015. Um, I just cite that as a published example. I'm wondering, you know, given the constraints you work under, how could uh, people, citizens, expect this committee is going to actually help advance the scale up and the ratcheting of ambition, which is a core feature of this agreement? Are there any, so shall we wait for, if there are any further questions, I'm happy to address, but maybe, yeah. Hi, my name is Emma Hamilton. I'm with the Lightus Foundation. Um, so respectfully, I think I can kind of agree um, with the previous gentleman that um, the Paris Agreement um, the parties who are participating aren't um, really progressing towards the goal of maintaining within a 1.5 degree limit. Um, so I was curious on you guys' opinion on possibly creating a new specialist worldwide climate agency. Um, so it's not just the countries who are focusing on this, because I know that the United Nations is very busy in and of itself with so many other um, priorities of their own. I think that um, a climate agency could instead focus specifically on climate, which is needed to progress um, in a speedy fashion, which is super necessary towards the 1.5 degree limit that is required. So I would like to know your opinions on that. Thank you. Hello and thank you very much for this event. Uh, my name is Tejas Rao and I'm with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. Um, in the presentations, we heard that members are elected for two-year terms or three-year terms. And the, the purpose of the committee is to facilitate and to implement, to help implement the Paris Agreement. And this is a very ongoing process. It's one that's going to take a lot of time and going to take a lot of effort from everyone. But given that we have two-year and three-year term limits for members, as well as um, elections taking place every two to three years, is there a work plan or a specific time frame that the committee looks to work under and what targets are sort of looked at to see whether the committee has been successful? What are the yardsticks of measurement for the committee's success? I'm just curious on, on hearing about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your questions. I think there is uh, um, another one, and uh, after that, uh, we will take it uh, and, uh, and close the, the event, because I'm afraid it's uh, five minutes that uh, you, we just have um, ahead. Thank you. OK, hi, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. And even though I came late, uh, but we are passionate about issues of has to do with the Paris Agreement. So in my country, uh, we are aligning the Paris Agreement implementation with the the LTS, and uh, looking at the global stock take, I just want to ask, can we combine the LTS and the issues of the Paris Agreement and communicate it? Because both strategies are uh, aligning and the differentiating actions being taken in both ways cannot actually be possible because at the end of the day, we'll uh, align the sectoral plans of the Paris Agreement with the, what we are doing in Nigeria for the LTS. My name is Choma. I am from Nigeria. I'm the DEX officer for NDC. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues, for your uh, uh, posing these important questions. And uh, I'm quite hopeful that uh, your interventions and your questions will be uh, helpful for our uh, 
uh, further consideration. Uh, let me first address uh, uh, the first question by our distinguished colleague, and uh, uh, he has uh, mentioned about uh, the role and responsibility of the committee in terms of its uh, facilitative uh, nature of the work of the committee. Uh, as many of us, uh, uh, we have already highlighted the role uh, uh, of the committee uh, uh, that will remain uh, a facilitative. And uh, Christina has also mentioned during her presentation, we do not want to give an impression that uh, uh, this is a sanctioned type of a regime like uh, uh, what happens in this UN Security Council or uh, uh, in other uh, UN bodies. Uh, over here, uh, we need to understand that uh, uh, what it can uh, impart to the parties in terms of uh, its value addition. Like, uh, I can give you uh, certain examples that uh, the committee can engage uh, with the party uh, concerned, and uh, it can identify certain uh, areas of work, it can make recommendations, and uh, it can also identify uh, certain areas in terms of uh, you know, finance, mobilization, technology transfer, and capacity building. It can also uh, make recommendations uh, uh, regarding, or it can suggest a work plan to the party concerned. And, uh, uh, and uh, finally, it can also make uh, certain recommendations uh, to the party concerned. And uh, I think uh, uh, over here, the challenge is uh, uh, to uh, to let party know about that uh, uh, this is a facilitative uh, work and we want to uh, help both the parties like uh, 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 the developed country parties or the developing country parties uh, based upon their uh, circumstances or national needs. So this is how uh, we see the work of uh, uh, the Paris Implementation and Compliance Committee. Uh, the second question that uh, uh, that was related with uh, uh, tenure of uh, uh, the election uh, or the members or the alternate members, uh, the members are uh, elected uh, for uh, uh, three years, followed by uh, another term, and uh, uh, which means that uh, it gives uh, a certain. Uh, period of uh, certainty or continuity uh, uh, to work in the committee and uh, uh, to uh, promote the work of the committee. So, so in terms of the yardstick, I think uh, this committee, uh, it reports to CMA annually and there is an annual report that the committee they, it has to submit to uh, to COP or uh, uh, to the CMA, and uh, over here, uh, uh, CMA is uh, uh, round about uh, more than 170 or 80 uh, parties. I'm not sure about the numbers, but over here they can evaluate the work of the committee. They can suggest. They can uh, recommend uh, to the committee uh, in terms of uh, what they are expecting. So uh, that is the thing. Christina, if you want to add. Yeah, very, very briefly, because we're running out of time, but the, the, these were very important questions, but I would like to address the first one, um, because there is, uh, I think, a need to understand of what the committee is mandated to do. The committee was designed to reflect the, uh, the architecture of the Paris Agreement, and we do know that communicating and maintaining an NDC is a legal obligation. Implementing and achieving the NDC is, is not part of that legal obligation. It was a decision that was made, a compromise that was found in Paris. So the, the mandate of the committee is to look whether a party has communicated and maintained an NDC or not. It's really, is that NDC in the registry or not? The committee doesn't look at whether the NDC is ambitious enough or is implemented or is achieved. That is not part of the committee's mandate when it takes up an issue on its own. I think that's very important um, to note. But that doesn't mean that a party cannot come to the committee 
on its own if it faces, for example, challenging in implementing and it's achieving its NDC. That possibility is there where the committee could actually support and help uh, the, uh, a party in that faces challenging in implementing and achieving its NDC. In terms of um, having, having no teeth, I think it's important to remember that an action plan or recommendations uh, or uh, finding of facts can carry with it some reputational risks that parties may want to avoid and that in itself can incentivize um, uh, behavior that is along, uh, that is compliant uh, with the Paris Agreement. I leave it at that and I would like to thank everyone one more time for your time and for interest in coming here and to the audience for your questions as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much uh, to, to our speakers for their informative engagement and thoughtful interventions. And also thank you very much uh, to the audience for, for your questions and, uh, and, and showing your views, which uh, has contributed to